Geraldine Moore, the Poet, by Tony Cade Bambara. Geraldine paused at the corner to pull up her knee socks. The rubber bands she was using to hold them up made her legs itch. She dropped her books on the sidewalk while she gave a good scratch. But when she pulled the socks up again, two fingers poked right through the top of her left one. That stupid dog, she muttered to herself, grabbing at her books and crossing against traffic. First he chews up my gym suit and gets me into trouble, and now my socks. Geraldine shifted her books to the other hand and kept muttering angrily to herself about Mrs. Watson's dog, which she minded two days a week for a dollar. She passed the hot dog man on the corner and waved. He shrugged as if to say business was very bad. Must be, she thought to herself. Three guys before you had to pack up and forget it. Nobody's got hot dog money around here. Geraldine turned down her street, wondering what her sister Anita would have for her lunch. She was glad she didn't have to eat the free lunches in high school anymore. She was sick of the funny-looking tomato soup and the dried-out cheese sandwiches and those oranges that were more green than orange. When Geraldine's mother first took sick and went away, Geraldine had been on her own except when Miss Gladys next door came in on Thursdays and cleaned the apartment and made a meatloaf so Geraldine could have dinner. But in those days, Geraldine never quite managed to get breakfast for herself. So she'd sit through social studies class, scrapping her feet to cover up the noise of her stomach growling. Now, Anita, Geraldine's older sister was living at home waiting for her husband to get out of the army. She usually had something good for lunch. Chicken and dumplings if she managed to get up in time, or baked ham from the night before and sweet potato bread. But even if there was only a hot dog and some baked beans, sometimes just a TV dinner if those soap operas kept Anita glued to the TV set. Anything was better than the noisy school lunchroom where monitors kept pushing you in a straight line or rushing you to the tables. Anything was better than that. Geraldine was almost home when she stopped dead. Right outside her building was a pile of furniture and some boxes. That wasn't anything new. She had seen people get put out in the street before. But this time the ironing board looked familiar. And she recognized the big, ugly sofa standing on its arm, its underbelly showing the hole where Mrs. Watson's dog had gotten to it. Miss Gladys was sitting on the stoop and she looked up and took off her glasses. Well, Jerry, she said slowly, wiping her glasses on the hem of her dress. Looks like you'll be staying with me for a while. She looked at the men carrying out a big box with an old doll sticking up out over the edge. Anita's upstairs. Go on up and get your lunch. Geraldine stepped past the old woman and almost bumped into the superintendent. He took off his cap to wipe away the sweat. Darn shame, he said to no one in particular. Poor people sure got a hard row to hoe. That's the truth, said Miss Gladys, standing up with her hands on her hips to watch the men set things on the sidewalk. Upstairs, Geraldine went into the apartment and found Anita in the kitchen. I don't know, Jerry, Anita said. I just don't know what we're going to do. But everything's going to be all right soon as Ma gets well. Anita's voice cracked as she set a bowl of soup before Geraldine. What's this, Geraldine said. It's tomato soup, Jerry. Geraldine was about to say something, but when she looked up at her big sister, she saw how Anita's face was getting all twisted as she began to cry. That afternoon, Mr. Stern, the geometry teacher, started drawing cubes and cylinders on the board. Geraldine sat at her desk, adding a column of figures in her notebook. The rent, the light and gas bills, and new gym suits and socks. Maybe they would move somewhere else, and she could have her own room. Geraldine turned the squares and triangles into little houses in the country. For your homework, Mr. Stern was saying with his back to the class. Set your problem up this way, he wrote, given in large letters, and then gave a formula for the first problem. Then he wrote, to find, and listed three items they were to include in their answers. Geraldine started to raise her hand to ask what all the squares and angles had to do with solving real problems like the one she had. Better not, and sat on her hands. Your big mouth got you in trouble last time. In hygiene class, Mrs. Potter kept saying the body was a wonderful machine. Every time Geraldine looked up from her notebook, she could hear the same thing. Right now, your body is manufacturing all the proteins and tissues and energy you need to get through tomorrow. And Geraldine kept wondering, how? How does my body know what it will need when I don't even know what I'll need to get through tomorrow? As she headed down the hall to her next class, Geraldine remembered that she hadn't done the homework for English Mrs. Scott had said to write a poem, and Geraldine had meant to do it at lunchtime. After all, there was nothing to it. A flower here, a raindrop there, moon, June, rose, nose. But the men carrying off the furniture had made her forget. And now put away your books, Mrs. Scott was saying as Geraldine tried to scribble a poem quickly. Today we can give King Arthur's knights a rest. Let's talk about poetry. Mrs. Scott moved up and down the aisles, talking about her favorite poems and reciting a line now and then. She got very excited whenever she passed a desk and could pick up the homework from a student who had remembered to do the assignment. 
A poem is your own special way of saying what you feel and what you see, Mrs. Scott went on, her lips moist. It was her favorite subject. Some poets write about the light that, that makes the world sunny, she said, passing Geraldine's desk. Sometimes an idea takes the form of a picture, an image. For almost half an hour, Mrs. Scott stood at the front of the room, reading poems and talking about the lives of the great poets. Geraldine drew more houses and designs for curtains. So for those who haven't done their homework, try it now, Mrs. Scott said. Try expressing what it is like to be, to be alive in this, this glorious world. Oh, brother, Geraldine muttered to herself as Mrs. Scott moved up and down the aisles again, waving her hands and leaning over the student's shoulder, saying, that's nice, or keep trying. Finally, she came to Geraldine's desk and stopped, looking down at her. I can't write a poem, Geraldine said flatly, before she even realized she was going to speak at all. She said it very loudly, and the whole class looked up. And why not? Mrs. Scott asked, looking hurt. I can't write a poem, Mrs. Scott, because nothing lovely is happening in my life. I haven't seen a flower since Mother's Day, and the sun don't shine on my side of the street. No robins come sing on my windowsill. Geraldine swallowed hard. She thought about saying that her father doesn't even come to visit anymore, but changed her mind. Just the rain comes, she went on, and the bills come, and the men come to move out our furniture. I'm sorry, but I can't write no pretty poem. Teddy Johnson leaned over and was about to giggle and crack the whole class up, but Mrs. Scott looked so serious that he changed his mind. You have just said the most, the most poetic thing, Geraldine Moore, said Mrs. Scott. Her hands flew up to touch the silk scarf around her neck. Nothing lovely has been happening in my life, she repeated it so quietly that everybody had to lean forward to hear. Class, Mrs. Scott said very sadly, clearing her throat. You have just heard the best poem you will ever hear. She went to the board and stood there for a long time, staring at the chalk in her hand. I'd like you to copy it down, she said. She wrote it just as Geraldine had said it. Bad grammar and all. Nothing lovely has been happening in my life. I haven't seen a flower since Mother's Day. And the sun don't even shine on my side of the street. No robins come sing on my window so. Just the rains comes, and the bills come, and the men to move out our furniture. I'm sorry, but I can't write no pretty poem. Mrs. Scott stopped writing, but she kept her back to the class for a long time, long after Geraldine had closed her notebook. And even when the bell rang and everyone came over to smile at Geraldine, or to tap her on the shoulder, or to kid about her being the school poet. Geraldine waited for Mrs. Scott to put the chalk down and turn around. Finally, Geraldine stacked up her books and started to leave. Then she thought she heard a whimper, the way Mrs. Watson's dog whimpered sometimes. And she saw Mrs. Scott's shoulders shake a little.